Next tonight, why is football the final frontier when it comes to people being able to say they're gay in public? Ryan, fashion -o. Oh, oh, what a goal! Hi everyone, uh, Danny Gray, I am the founder of Warm Paint For Men, which is a male cosmetic brand designed for a male audience, specifically around breaking the stereotype that does surround men wearing makeup. And I'm uh, Darren Eady, former professional footballer for Norwich City. I'm really excited to have a male on today, who is the niece of Justin Fashion News. It's a really difficult topic to, to touch on, but one that is very much as, as we do, trying to make sure we draw awareness to it and he had all untold amounts of pressure on him. And obviously what he was doing was, was playing, but also he felt the pressures of everything else going on around him. So this is what we're about. This is what Norwich is about. This is what Wallpaint's about. It's about breaking stereotypes, starting conversations, even if they can be hard conversations to have, because that's what needs to happen to make a difference. So really excited about today. Amal Fashionu, thanks very much for, for joining us. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you for being our second guest on uh, Challenging Stereotypes with, with Norwich City and with Warpaint. Um, I mean, where do we start, first of all? I mean, it's, uh, you're, you're the niece of Justin, and we're obviously going to talk a lot about Justin Fashionu today and daughter of uh, John Fashionu, who uh, many football and people background will know, of course, as well. Um, just tell us a little bit about the foundation you, you've got, first of all, that you set up in, in Justin's kind of memory. So thank you, first of all, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, so I set up the Justin Fashionu Foundation around 10 months ago now. Um, it's been, I've been campaigning actively since 2012, since I made um, my first documentary, which was called Britain's Gay Footballers. So effectively, since then, I have kind of fully taken on the role of, you know, activist within football. Um, and just recently is when I kind of could get myself together to actually start up a proper foundation. So with the help of the PFA, um, yeah, we managed to do the Justin Fashion Foundation and it's been going incredible since then. Um, you know, we've been helping a few footballers. We've been counseling a few footballers. Um, We've been, you know, we couldn't physically launch because of Corona yet. So um, we were planning to launch on the 19th of February. Um, that was Justin's birthday and it was also LGBTQ plus month. Um, but, you know, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, the National Football Hall of Fame in Manchester. So we couldn't effectively do the launch, but we will be launching soon. Um, but I must say that, you know, we've been getting incredible amount of attention, attraction. Um, a lot of people are speaking about it and we're just very proud of the fact that, you know, footballers have come to us and said, look, this is our situation. We need help. How can we move forward and how can you guys help us? So for us, that's incredible. And um, it just means that hopefully within the next year or two years, there will be an openly gay footballer and, you know, we'll be able to be by their side. That's amazing, Amal. Congratulations. Like, read a lot about you, the story and everything. So what you're doing is incredible and um, much needed, if I'm honest. Looking at Norwich City as well, you've, you've worked quite a bit with Norwich in recent years as well with the, the, the great work that they do with the LGBT community. And, and there was a tournament a couple of years ago that you were involved with. Can you just tell us a little bit about that as well and how much Norwich City means to you because of, because I mean... of Justin as well? Norwich is obviously, you know, where my dad and Justin grew up. And so that's the place in England when I was living in Madrid that I kind of most visited. Um, I have family So Madrid also. and Norwich? Yeah. <laughs> Madrid and Norwich, that was it. Okay. Exactly. Slightly exactly. different weather. What was the weather like? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Norwich is very close to my heart. And I think it's a football team which I've most worked with and which the foundation works with now. Um, we actually have an ambassador scheme with the Norwich City Football Club, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And um, I just think Norwich City is fantastic. I, I wouldn't say it's my favourite team just because people... Whoa, 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 whoa. Who's the favourite team? Let's not, not push it there. But um, it is fantastic how everyone gets together and it's the sense of community. And I think that, yeah, if, if football clubs like Norwich can kind of talk about LGBTQ+, and we can talk about mental health and racism in football and come together. Um, I just think that slowly, 
we'll get to a place where football will be, you know, free for all. Everyone can play and feel happy and safe and it will be a less hostile environment than it is right now, to be fair. But Norwich is kind of at the forefront of that, isn't it? It's, it's done that for years in terms of making these steps and working with brands like Warpaint. You know, that, that's what Norwich City does. And, and as you said, there's been three of the academy players that are now signing pro that have become ambassadors for the foundation as well. Yes. So as and we said before, that education, Canary, isn't it? Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Yes, and Dee yeah, Cunningham exactly is great. That. And I must say that Dee has involved me in a lot of activities and she helps the foundation quite a bit as well. And I must say that that flag up in Norwich City <laughs> football <laughs> kind of day in the stadium really impressed me. I'm not sure that who... One. Yes, 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 this one. Exactly. That's the one. one. Look, look at and that. And on the look, other look, look side, the back of that one. This. Yes, yes. There he is. And Stephen Fry was wearing this and Delia Smith. And, um, you know, Dee's done incredible work with the foundation. And I, yeah, I love her. She's a great person. Obviously, been campaigning and doing stuff since 2012. Since you've launched the foundation, uh, you've already talking to like a lot of different footballers who are reaching out. Is that a variant of footballers from? I don't want to say well known because, whether or is it can be it can be footballers from anywhere, can it? From any level of sport. I mean, you know, football is football, and sport is sport, and we're human. So essentially, you know, for me personally, it's about just helping anyone who needs it so whether even if you aren't a footballer at some point you know but right now the foundation is helping um two footballers who are currently you know very famous and um they play in the premier league and there are other players who are gay and who aren't in the premier league but are in the champions league and some are just you know they're just younger so there's some are you know under 21. What always goes around my mind is about this, this is the I don't know I, I don't know if this stat is correct but apparently 10% of men are gay so yeah. when you look at that stat for me and you think well how many professional footballers are there uh I'm talking top level 800 yeah. 1000 footballers so you know, even you saying two in the Premiership, people will be like, oh my God, I can't believe it. But this is for me about, that does not shock me one bit. And so it shouldn't. Well, this is the reason why, you know, I feel like the foundation is super relevant now more than ever, I would say. And it's sad to say that, you know, I was speaking about this in 2012. No one even wanted to listen to half of the things I had to say because they were kind of like, first of all, I'm a female. Then I'm not a footballer. Um, they were like, and then they were like, you know, gay footballers don't exist. So they were like, effectively, what are you doing? You know, trying to bring up something that is not there. And I was just like, you know, statistically, it's it's impossible. And, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And in every other walk of life, we're talking about it as if it was something, you know, normal. I mean, you have um, in fashion, if I get a stylist who isn't gay, you're kind of like, what's going on? Do you know what I mean? Like, you're like, why? Because he would be the best. But within football, people are shocked. And Matt, this is a really interesting point for me as well, because I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of those ratios with footballers and, and thinking about how many gay footballers there might be out there. And, and looking from my point of view and being in that environment, because it was so um, like a kind of testosterone fueled and, and, uh, and male led, and it was almost like I felt look, the, probably the ratios aren't quite so high in football as they might be in other sports or in other walks of life, because a, a lot of... I knew kids who uh, maybe, you know, felt that way. They, they never got the opportunity to play. Justin was, was very, obviously, obviously very, very brave and very strong to be able to do that. I think a lot of players who maybe have felt that way wouldn't have even got that far to become a professional footballer. So maybe the ratios aren't quite as high as we think, but that obviously doesn't take away the fact that there is still an awful lot to be done and an awful lot of people out there that need the help. Well, I guess that's my main worry is the fact that there are kids out there who are, you know, could be the next Messi or could be the next Cristiano. Yeah. And, you know, they're fearing, you know, to do a sport essentially because the sport hasn't allowed for these guys to come out and just be happy and for it to be normalized. So therefore, first of all, they think, OK, so if I'm the, the one who comes out now, I'm going to be known for the rest of my life as that one gay footballer. So essentially, they're also worried that their talent gets forgotten. So instead of being known as, you know, the most amazing footballer in the world, you'll be known as, you know, the second, you know, gay footballer in the world. So that's another, yeah. there's a lot of elements towards this, this kind of issue. And I think that sometimes we just kind of think, oh, you know, are there any gays in football? Who's gay in football? And sometimes we don't even think about it. Sometimes we don't even question it because 
right now there aren't any gays in football supposedly you know you have Thomas Beatty um but all of all of the footballers have essentially retired and then decided to come out which is also disappointing in a way because you know you think to yourself how many years have you effectively lived as a footballer pretending to be someone who you're not and how is that you know paying on your mental health so on that point Amal, I I can resonate slightly with that so for me that I'm a straight guy wearing makeup for which I have for 20 years was absolutely not seen seen as the thing to do um so I kept, I kept it hidden for a long, long time. Right? I'm not saying it's on the same level because it's not, but it helps me, right? And then bringing out Warpaint as a brand was, first of all, I had to think, well, all my mates are going to know about it. People who aren't my mates are going to know about it and are going to judge me. I thought, I know we'll get backlash for it and we have, like, unbelievable. When we've gone, we went viral and then we had 8 million Twitter views in 24 hours and it was about toxic masculinity. And I thought everything was over, right? I thought I'd lost the brand and it died. And we went through that pain, right? Of But what it did, it started the conversation about people talking about men's makeup. Since then, we've had 500 press articles. It's been very positive lately. We went viral two weeks ago, for example, again, but this time it was very 50-50. But what I'm trying to relate it to is, like, the way I felt when we did it was so hard. But getting through that... Right, and now seeing the other side where loads of people and men are reaching out to me going, thank you so much for making it almost normal or now I feel like I can use something which I wouldn't before. That is for me about this step with a footballer coming out as gay. It will obviously at the beginning, then it's going to be hard, but that person will help change yeah. history forever. And they'll still, and like where we are now, we're almost further forward than that. So that first step is always like, what Justin did was unbelievable, you know. And then for someone to do it now when it's been such a big gap, it's just like, that's the, it's the fear factor, isn't it? Of the unknown, of what's going on, or what they think is going to happen, and then what actually happens. Amal, that was the question I was, I was going to ask you, Amal. I mean, why do you think there has been such a delay since, since Justin was at the forefront of doing that again? What, why has there been such a massive gap in football to, to get to that next step? It seems like it's almost been pressed and paused. You know, I just, I kind of, it's just a tough question. It's almost like it's a mix between, you know, fear of the unknown, as Danny just said, um, you know, coming out. I think these footballers as well, they're craving a roadmap, you know, they're, they're craving this kind of roadmap in a way of what will happen once they come out, you know, and it's very difficult because you can't really, you can't judge that. You don't know what's going to happen, you know. Um, and in their minds, they're thinking, you know, but what do I now come out and lose my contract? Do I lose my deals? You know, will my teammates be, you know, happy with it? How will the day to day be? Um, you know, will there be too much pressure, social media, online? It's, it, there's so many elements that it's almost like really difficult. I would love to tell a footballer, you know, it, it's going to be easy. It's an easy road. Just come out and do it. But at the same time, it's it's extreme. It's something you need to think about, and it's something that you know potentially you need to plan. You need to plan. And, and, and how do you plan this? It's it's crazy sometimes to think about it. And that's and that's the sadness of it, isn't it? Because somebody can do that, but the, the challenges they're still going to have now in such a society where we are much more understanding than we've ever been with anything in life, the pressures and and actually. The, the backlash they will get still is just going to be huge, particularly in football, because they're in you know a global sport, which everybody's going to be looking at. But the one thing I can say, they will have backlash, but it won't be what Justin went through. You know, that's the one thing I don't want people to think. It's not because Justin came out and then committed suicide. You know, the, the gap between him coming out and him committing suicide is quite big. You know, it wasn't... I just think that a lot of people, well, a lot of footballers, actually, let me say, they fear the fact that, you know, look at look at what happened to Justin. He was brave, he was courageous, and then next minute, you know, they just see him committing suicide. And the problem is, is that there were a lot of, a lot of other factors which Justin was also dealing with. You know, you're talking about religion, you're talking about race, you're talking about him being a foster child, um, him being the brother of my dad. There's a lot of elements. So I do also sometimes tell the footballers, like, you know it, it's not your case you might just be a gay man who's playing football who's extremely talented and you might come out now and yes you'll get a bit of you know whatever for coming out and online rubbish but 
at the end of the day, what's better to effectively live a lie or be yourself and just get a bit of this for a few months and then break through? It goes back to like a little bit what I just said about what they need to know, whoever it is, it's not going to last forever. You know, that, that backlash, because I, I thought it was for me. And I'm not trying to relate because it's not the same, but from that experience of thinking, oh, it's over, we're getting absolute pelters everywhere around the world, by the way, ABC News, Good Morning America, thinking, what, and then a week later it dies and it's, that's what I'm saying the answer was a bit short but now I'm like it's probably the best thing that ever happened because it started the conversation it started, it started the conversation and this is what this one person's going to do is going to help like it'll be painful for a month or whatever it is but then it'll be the best thing and they'll change lives I think the, the, the issue still within inside the change rooms is the, the inside of the football change room as, as a group of lads together has not changed that's still the same it was decades ago it's, it's not moved on like society's moved on so I think there's a there's a massive almost lag in behind and what they're thinking so as much as society's moved on we all talk about different things in life they don't so much in a changing room still we're still stuck in that that kind of archaic look at the way football should be in a changing rooms and if you step outside of that the, the fear is too great and I think that's that seems to be the biggest problem it's just it's a massive lag the thing is even when I speak to my dad the problem is is that footballers actually just like that though this is the problem. Yeah, like it's almost do. like something that I'm not sure that that can even change. It's almost like a pack mentality of wolves, and that is the way they're born and brought up and bred, and that's the way they're going to continue. You know, so you know we're trying at many levels to try and change, and for you know even just awareness, even just speaking about it. The fact that I do so many interviews about it for me, it's an honor. Just the fact that we're talking about it. This ten years ago, we weren't actually talking about this. Like even mental health, we're, we're going through a period of change where I just feel like, yeah, within the next year, there will be a gay footballer, you know, playing in the Premier League and it won't really be that much of an issue after a certain period of time has passed. Yeah, is it about small steps then? Is it about starting with the youngsters at football clubs and educating them on the way through, like Norwich City are doing at the moment, which we'll talk about in a little while. And and almost just those, the, the terminology again, and Danny and I have talked about this before, about the terminology we use and the language we use around mental health, like, oh, he's nuts or he's, he's mad or he's stupid. Now, there's no intent in that, it really. It's just, a, it's just a throwaway, flippant comment. And I think the same is used in football in the change rooms when it comes to, oh, you're gay. Somebody does something, that's, that's gay. And, and it's, it's a real kind of flippant comment, but I don't think it, people realise just the damage that does to the person who's receiving it, who, who could be. A hundred percent. And I think the only way to change that in the future is definitely at grassroots levels. It's a case of, you know, educating the young and making them aware of certain words and what they mean and how that could affect other people and things like that. I think that will help essentially the society and environment of football, especially because without that, I'm not sure how we change it because the people who are already in position and in power and place, you know, they're already old enough to know what's good and bad. And sometimes they choose to do the bad or they don't know any better. You know what I mean? Um, we've just had an incident now with the PFA. Was it at the PFA, I think? Um, no, at the FA, at the FA. There was an incident where someone used a word that they shouldn't have used. And, you know, you just kind of consider that at, at that position, you wouldn't, you would know better, basically. You know, you should know better. And if you were, have been given that certain position, effectively it's a bit tricky but you know and you could say oh you know he didn't mean it and it was a way he probably didn't actually I don't believe he he meant it in a wrong way but you know it's where we're living now and we're trying to move forward you're spot on it's almost like society's infiltrating football and the right people are saying the right things outside of it but the people who are still inside the bubble of football aren't quite getting it or, or are too far behind and, and that will take time it will happen um, I wanted to talk to you about the, the female side of the game as well, Amal, because for me, that was I've worked a lot with um, some under-21 players in the female game and youngsters that are coming through and moving into the female game. Now, for me, that, that's the complete opposite. It's, it's actually incredible. For, for me, you know, in a lot of interviews, it's almost like the female footballers have to be gay. And this is another thing. It's almost like, why are we assuming that because the woman likes to play football, that next minute she's a lesbian? It's just, it, it, there's no correlation whatsoever, but people seem to find a correlation. But yet when you look at the men's game, none of them can be gay. This is exactly what we're talking about though, with these uh, uh, these meetings and stuff. It's, it's about stereotypes. And this is the thing that drives me mad. And it's, 
something that's changed a lot, but that's a stereotype that, okay, if a girl wants to play football, she must be a lesbian. You know, if a, if a guy, is a gay, is there a gay footballer out there who can't be because he plays football? Or a guy wants to wear makeup, or he must be gay. And I think that's why we, you know, sponsored Norwich City was to get, you know, well, honestly, we're not going to sell one product out of it. You know, that's not the aim of it. It was the aim to start the conversation and guys go, you know, we got backlash in the beginning, but then then it, I just think it will help some people make a decision go, oh, actually, well, if they're sponsoring a football club, is it, it's probably all right. We were talking about education and changing, changing mindsets. I know, obviously, your dad, I don't know if he disagreed or said so you can come out, and now he's completely flipped to actually be part of the foundation and everything like that. Could you just explain about how he used to think to how he feels now and the learnings? Because I think that could be yeah. really credible. So I just think that my dad was kind of in a position where it was very difficult for him. I mean, you're talking about the late 80s, early 90s. For him, you know, he got to the position where he was finally doing really well. And, you know, he had he was part of the crazy gang and he was playing for Wimbledon and everything else. And then, you know, next minute um, his brother comes out as gay, you know. Um, I think in a way he wanted to protect his family. He didn't want his mum to see that. Um, and I just genuinely think that at the time he was, he just didn't, he just didn't agree with what Justin was doing at all. And he would have rather paid Justin to stay, you know, hidden and to not talk about it than for him to come out and say who he was. And at the time, I don't think my dad was equipped with the right kind of elements to support or help Justin in any kind of way and instead of helping him he he essentially you know made his life a bit more difficult than it already was which was very difficult so for Justin you know that was extremely hard and I I, I see it in a lot of interviews obviously I wasn't born and for a lot of the time I was very young so I I wasn't able to assess or be there or judge myself, but I have seen interviews and, you know, I know my dad very well and I knew Justin very well. So I can tell by the way it was going on that my dad felt a certain way and he, he loved Justin very much. And so it was very difficult to combine both. And then, yeah. And then I think now what it is, is that my dad has realized that, you know, being gay is just not a big deal and that, you know, back then, whatever ideology he was thinking, you know, had to change. And now, you know, he went on SAS, Who Dares Wins, and he was talking about it openly. And there's a lot of times where I, I look at it and I'm like, wow, he's actually optionally talking about it very freely. And he's kind of like forgiven himself. I thought that was amazing on SAS, we really did. Like, I, thought it was, I, thought it, I think he's a top legend anyway, but I think it was incredible, all of that. But that, that, was, a, that, was, a, that was a prime example in a nutshell of the pressures of the football club, in particular in Wimbledon, that he was at and the persona he had to carry. The crazy gang, look, 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 he had this image that he felt he could not, even for his own brother, he couldn't give up. And that's not from the pressures of not loving his brother, it's the pressures of the football and being in that arena. That's what made him make the choices he made. So it shows how difficult it was to crack back then. And, and actually, it doesn't seem like we've moved on much further now, really. So tell me a bit more about the foundation of our, what's the plans for like, the, I know obviously it's difficult with lockdown and like the next 12 yeah. months, you've got some cool stuff planned or like, what, what, are you, what are you doing? Well, we've got a launch planned, which is effectively the first thing we'd like to do, just to introduce ourselves and talk about what we're doing. Um, we have a book on the way, um, it's an educational book for kids. Um, so it's between the ages of 10 and 15, roughly. Um, so we just explain a bit about Justin's story and we talk a bit about mental health, racism in football and homophobia, which are the three main areas that the foundation focuses on. And we've got a few concepts and a few ideas going on, like the ambassadorial kind of role. Um, so we're trying to do that with a few other football clubs. We've done it with Norwich City, how are you uh, amazing, by the way? A book is amazing as well, so congratulations yeah. with that. How are you fit finding, so trying to find these other clubs to come on, because the Ambassador yeah. Programme for me is incredible. How are you finding it with what it's linked to and getting other clubs to look at it and put fo players forward? How have that, because obviously you've had three players from Norwich do it, which is incredible. Uh, yeah. How have you fi found that? Is it tough sometimes or, or, or what? I must say, you know, I, I'm going to be completely honest with this. I think when you talk about mental health and racism, even, 
um, the doors open way quicker and way easier. Um, I think when you now say homophobia in football, for some reason, there's a certain fear still towards that kind of element. So when we talk about the three, for us, it's, it's sometimes easier to try and open the doors through mental health and racism and then convince them in a way to add homophobia, which is sad for me because we shouldn't have to do that. Um, but it's the way things are right now. But I feel like slowly we will get there. So if anyone's watching and listening to this and they think want to get involved, don't even think about the consequences. There won't be any consequences for it. It'll just show you yeah. forward thinking and leading the way. So get in t- contact with Amal and put do something that's honestly going to make a difference. Like I, I'm not even yeah. saying it in a flippant comment. This will honestly change. I say it, it can change history, right? If so, if we can break this, it'll, it'll save so many lives. And and so what we're trying to do in makeup, if you can do it in football it will fud through to a lot more stuff. So get in contact with Amal if anyone's listening. Please. Yeah, well, I think as well, it, do you know what? I think as well, it's so important, Amal, to, to have someone as, as, as your character and your drivenness and your, your drive to make this happen because, you know, you, you have got the name to be able to open those doors as well. And, and you, you know, you have to use that. You have to play on that. And, and that must be difficult for you at times. Darren. I'm sure. But you have, but you have to. You know, you can you can bang down doors much better than than anybody else can in this situation. So you know, it's fantastic work that you're doing. It's, you know, you must be ever so proud, and your family must be hugely proud of what you're doing as well. I hope so, because honestly, this is something that you know. I don't even know how I got into this in a way, but I just did because I just saw the situation and I was like, it's just not right. And when something's not right and it's not fair, and it's not equal for me. It was a problem. So a lot of people, you know, they ask me why, you know, why if your uncle, I probably, if Justin wasn't gay, I probably would still be doing this. I just think it's wrong, you know? It's like in fashion, like, but why? But why do we even have to discuss this? Why does this even have to be an issue? But it is an issue because they're still fearing because there are no gay footballers, you know? And that's why you kind of have to work backwards to then go forwards. but yeah, sometimes it's difficult. And I guess sometimes I feel like I'm a bit alone in this because obviously. Yeah, I've said about Danny as well before and it kind of applies to the same as what you're doing within football. You're sticking your head into the lion's mouth within football because it is, it is such a difficult environment to crack and make changes. And it takes a long time because it's closed off. Everything's closed off in football. So you know the work you've done and the progress you've made. Yeah, but the progress you've made so far is incredible. Thank you. I appreciate it, Darren. Thank you. And do you know what? Do you know what? Just quickly on our last episode, obviously we were talking with Stephen Fry, Sir Stephen Fry, amazing, and he he sort of said something to me, made me sort of think actually, and it was about time, right? And you know, small changes and where we think we want to get somewhere quicker, which we all do. Like I want to get somewhere yesterday, whatever I do. But you need to make these small things changes, and I promise yeah. you, what you're doing, Amal. Is the, it's making a big impact, but these are still like what I talked about that newspaper article and stuff like that. The conversation is changing slightly. Yeah. It's going to happen soon, and you're a massive part of that. And once it does, it's going to change everything. And like sometimes you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall, like I do with when I started my brand. But if you just keep yeah. plugging away and making small little things that are going to make a small difference, you'll change one person's mentality or a couple and then eventually it will tip. So thank just you, really thank amazing you. and keep going. Absolutely fantastic. Amal. Look, thank you so much for joining. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'm sure it's a lot warmer where you are than where we are at the moment. Um, and good luck with it. And if there's anything that myself is. and Danny can help with, and Nor- Norris City is a football club, um, just give us a shout. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Amal, thank you again for me, honestly. I, I mean a lot. Thank you, Danny. Wow, what a guest. What another episode. Loads of amazing topics covered. I think it's incredible the work she's doing and I feel her pain a little bit in trying to break the barrier and make those small steps to the to the wider goal. But unbelievable work and she's be so proud of what she's doing. Yeah, she's a she's a driven character and I think it's gonna take that. And as I said to you before, Danny, that the work you're doing with War Paint and Minora City is is kind of groundbreaking, but you are stepping into the the lion's den um, and it'll be difficult and I'm sure she's finding it difficult but I think she's certainly the one person that can head it up and, and, and make a real change and as we said before it starts almost educating right down at the youngsters and, and bringing that through and in, in and as when we spoke to Stephen Fry it will take time it always takes time but these conversations and the messages that you you're putting out there and I'm putting out there and, and Amal is putting out there things will change and that's all we're asking. 
definitely. And anyone's out there listening in terms of a football club, reach out to Amal. She needs your help. So brilliant, Darren. Thank you so much again, mate. Can't wait for the next episode. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll do it in person. If not, this will do.